Welcome to the River Online Sermon. Thank you for joining with me today, but before I get started, I want to make sure to let you know that this Sunday at the River, uh, we will have our annual meeting after our worship service. And if you're not able to join us in person and would like to watch that, like to see that time, please reach out to us and let us know. And we are hoping to record it so that we can make it available to those who can't be there in person. Now let me pray for our time together today. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this time to, to, uh, to be together. I thank you for this day and, and for your love for us. And I pray that you would help me as I teach, that you would guide and direct me about what it is you want me to say. And I pray that you would help us all to be open to the things you want us to receive from your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So are you familiar with the Great Commission? So it's a commission from Jesus to his followers, and it's found in Matthew 28 as well as other passages in Scripture. Now, what is a commission? Well, the dictionary defines it as an instruction, command, or duty given to a person or group of people, or at least that's one of the definitions. That's kind of the one that fits, I think, best with what we're talking about today. So then the question becomes, what makes the Great Commission great? Well, I would say probably two things. First of all, it's great because it comes from Jesus, right? But the second thing is because um, it, it's some of Jesus's last words to his followers before heading back to heaven. So that kind of makes it stand out that this great commission. You know, the Barna Research Group did a poll recently and asked uh, churchgoers uh, what they knew about the great commission. And do you know what they found out? So 51% had never heard of it. 25% had heard of it, but didn't know what it meant. 17% knew what it was and 6% weren't sure. Now I'm guessing that we have talked about the Great Commission enough at the river that hopefully our percentage of understanding of it is a little bit higher. But if you've never heard of it or if you don't remember what it means, um, well, then you're in for a treat today because today we're gonna be talking about the Great Commission. Please turn it from your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 28. Now we're in the midst of a 40-day prayer focus and the theme for this past week was reawakening uh, to the mission of Christ. Now there were several passages to choose from this week, but when you speak about the mission of Christ, there's one passage for me that really jumps out and that's the Great Commission passage. Now the context here in Matthew 28 is that it comes after Christ's crucifixion and his resurrection, after Jesus has spent um, these 40 days appearing to many people in his resurrected form, and one last time before he ascends to heaven, he meets with his closest followers on a mountaintop to share with them this great commission. Now, three of the four gospels um, end with some variation of this commissioning speech from Jesus to his followers. And the book of Acts actually begins with this same or some variation of this. But this version here in Matthew 28 is probably the most well-known as the great commission passage. Let's take a look, beginning with verse 16. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Now this may be a familiar passage to you. It's one of our foundational passages for our denomination. So because of that, in my role with the national office, as well as a professor at Crown and, and being here at the river as a pastor, when you combine all those things, I have um, taught on and preached and talked about this passage many, many times over the last couple of decades. Um, so if you hear me saying something today that you have heard me say in the past, please bear with me. But... I did approach this passage new and fresh this time uh, to try and make it as if it was the first time I was preaching on it rather than just sharing something that I had written in the past. So let's take a moment and dig into these verses. Notice, first of all, we have the 11 disciples rather than the 12 because by this time, Judas obviously was no longer with them after betraying Jesus. And by the time we arrive in this passage, these 11 men had already seen and talked to Jesus several times over the past 40 days, but he gathers them together one more time before heading back to heaven. We see in verse 16 that he directed them to this mountain. We don't know which mountain it is or why exactly he directed them there, or I guess we know why because he wanted to share them this, but, um, but he 
he specifically wanted them to be here for this moment. And so they gathered together because they were his disciples, because they had already uh, laid down their lives to follow him. And, and so when he directed, they followed. So they met him at this mountain. But notice their response to Jesus in verse 17. It says that they worshiped him, but some doubted. What do you think of that response? Well, before Christ's resurrection, the disciples probably had an idea of who he was, but maybe it was not really fully formed. However, witnessing the crucifixion and, and, and the resurrection probably clued them in much more to the reality that he was not just an earthly messiah. This man that they had walked with and learned from was not just their teacher, he was God the Son in flesh and blood. And if they had not fully realized that in the past, I would imagine that by now it was beginning to sink in more and more. But this verse also suggests that some were not fully convinced, or at least they were still trying to figure it all out. Now the word there can mean doubt, or to hesitate, or waver. Some scholars try to say that this refers to others outside the 11 disciples who were also there, that the 11 disciples were fine, but the other, some of the others doubted. Uh, I don't know. It may be the case, but um, all that we have here is the, the mention of the, the disciples themselves. And I don't really have an issue if it was one of the 11 or even all of the 11 who struggled with this, with all that was going on. I mean, it's a lot. It was one thing to follow Jesus as their master, but worshiping him would have marked a significant difference to everything they'd been taught in their lives. It would have been hard and it would not be a surprise to me to know that they were still struggling, still somewhat hesitant and wavering with what all of this meant. Actually, I think it would probably not be until Pentecost when they received the Holy Spirit that, that they would really develop that boldness and passion of following Christ that seems to characterize the rest of their, their ministry throughout the book of Acts. So I'm okay if some of them hesitated at this moment. Actually, I kind of find it encouraging. I kind of like that image because I think maybe that's our experience as well. Even though we're Christians, we don't necessarily have everything figured out. We're still struggling at times to understand some things and, and we have lingering doubts and, and confusion. We can be hesitant and waver at times, right? Being a Christian requires faith and trust. And sometimes that that involves a struggle with doubt and hesitancy. It's kind of like that's what the faith journey is. And think about this. Jesus knew what was going on inside of them. He knew their doubts. And yet he still chose to use these men to do the work that he was calling them to do. They were not perfect. They probably felt very inadequate. But in the days after this, God would work through them in amazing ways. Then Jesus gives them this commission, and he begins in verse 18 with this phrase, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. What do you think that means, and why did Jesus start there? Well, throughout his time on earth, Jesus displayed his authority. He displayed it over the physical world by healing people, calming the seas, walking on water, things like that. He also displayed his authority over the spiritual world by forgiving sins and delivering people. He displayed his authority over death itself, even by raising Lazarus and, and others from the dead, as well as his, his own resurrection. He even displayed his authority in his teaching, as many noted that he did not teach like everybody else. And now Jesus was heading back to heaven, and any limits that he had placed upon himself when he became a man would be gone. And he has this full authority over all things in heaven and on earth. And so I think he begins with these words to encourage them. He was not sending them out in their own power or authority, but under his own. And that's a whole lot of authority, a whole lot of power. Now remember that, and we'll come back to it a little bit later on. But first, let's take a look at what he was calling them to do. In verse 19, he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Now, if you have ever talked with me about this passage, you may know that there's something here that I emphasize. And so my question is, is what is the main verb in this phrase? So we have a tendency to think it is the word go, but it's not. It's actually the word that is translated here as make disciples. The word go is a participle, just like teaching and baptizing. Actually, that word go can more literally be translated with the phrase go and as you're going. Now, it's not passive. It's an imperative, um, but it's like, it's, in other words, it's telling them as they go from that place, as they go about their lives, 
They're to do so with purpose and intentionality, to go and as you go, live out this mission, this commissioning on your lives. Go with this commissioning that defines how you do everything else. That's an everyday kind of commission. It's not meant to just govern an event, like go there and do this. It's, it's, it's as you go throughout your life, an ongoing way of looking at your life. As you go, whatever you do, make disciples. It's a constant, ongoing responsibility to live out. Now, sometimes I think this verse gets mistakenly used as a challenge to those who are called to be missionaries, as if it is saying, who will go? But that's not what's being said here, is it? It's not a question as if maybe some will follow and some won't. It's a commission for all of us. As we go through our lives, this is the mission. This is our mission. Make disciples. Now, there is a specific call to missions here in this passage, but it's in the phrase of all nations. That phrase about making disciples of all peoples, or, or, or it's, it's about making disciples of all peoples or all people groups. It's, it's meant for us to be going beyond just the people who are right around us, and a recognition of it is our responsibility to make disciples of all the world. So there is that missions component, but it's in that word of all peoples or all nations. So this leads then to the question, what does it mean to make disciples? What does that look like? It's a good question, right? Now, the rest of this verse and beginning, uh, the beginning of the next helps us answer that a little bit. It says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So here, Jesus specifically points to baptizing and teaching. Why those two things? Why does Jesus specifically mention them? And what, does it mean, what do they mean for helping us understand what it looks like to make disciples? Well, for me, when I look at those two words, baptizing and teaching, I, I feel like there's a, a bigger picture kind of idea there. I think that it's kind of like the, the, the baptizing word suggests to me kind of like the first part of disciple making, leading someone to make a decision to follow Christ. It implies repentance and belief and action. Now, I would not use this verse to say that baptism is necessary for salvation, but rather that baptism is a response of faith. In some way, shape, or form, people need to respond to Christ. They need to come to Christ. Now, the second part suggests ongoing discipleship, growth, obedience, learning what it actually looks like to be a disciple, things like that, that teaching aspect. I think somewhere along the line, we began to treat this great commission as if it said, go and make converts. But that's not what it says, does it? It says, go and make disciples. And, and that is a much longer process that, rather than just leading someone to conversion. It involves coming alongside and helping people learn all that it looks like to follow Christ over time. The word disciple means learner. It means growing. It means becoming like the one we're following. So making a disciple involves more than just inviting them to pray a prayer or to come to church. It means walking alongside them so they can understand what it looks like to be a disciple. Discipleship.org defines disciple making like this. Disciple making is entering into relationships to intentionally help people follow Jesus, be changed by Jesus, and join the mission of Jesus. Disciple making includes the whole process from conversion through maturation and multiplication. It involves the kind of relationship like we see demonstrated between Jesus and his disciples. Now, what do you think are some of the things that disciple making might entail. You know, Julie and I try uh, to disciple our children throughout their lives as they're growing up. We do so with devotions and having spiritual conversations with them and things like that. But I intentionally do a one year discipleship with, with the kids, their senior year of high school. And we talk about some of the key things like, like their understanding of Christ, the Trinity, the importance of scripture, the character of God, prayer, worship, evangelism, fellowship, the work of the Holy Spirit, sanctification, and things like that. I try to give them a broad scope of all that it means. I want to make sure that, that their faith is becoming their own, that they're really knowing what it looks like to walk with Christ and follow him. I think this is an area that we actually maybe have fallen short sometimes in the church, at least in America. I often ask students at Crown if uh, they have ever been intentionally discipled, and many of them say that they have not. Now, some discipleship just naturally happens, right, in the home and 
and through going to church and, and youth group and, and Bible studies and, and um, listening to sermons and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I also think there's this place, this calling upon our lives to be making disciples, like intentionally walking with someone like Jesus did with his disciples. Now, if you feel like you've never been intentionally discipled and it's something that you feel is lacking in your life that you would like to have that, um, reach out to us and let us know and we can look into the, the possibility of, of, of helping you f find someone who can do that with you. Then notice how this passage ends. It says, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. What do you think about this part? Well, I think this goes back to the beginning. It's about Christ's authority, his power, his work, we don't need to rely upon ourselves and our ability to accomplish his commission. When we are making disciples, the Lord is with us. We can rely upon him. Actually, we must rely upon him. It's his commission. It's his authority. It is his gospel. He is the one who draws people to himself. It's not, a, it's not something we can do on our own. We, we're never meant to do this on our own. We're meant to rely upon him. Now, I love the fact that Jesus both begins and ends this commission with his authority and his ongoing presence. Overall, like I said earlier, it's a very well-known passage, right? You may have heard it many times before. And as we close, I want to ask you, what have you seen in this passage today that you're going to take with you? Maybe it's something new. Maybe there's something new that has struck out to you. Or maybe it's some, maybe something you've known all along. I don't know. What are you going to take with you from this passage today? I want to close with just a quick look at one more word. For whatever reason, when I was preparing the sermon this time, in this passage, a word stood out to me that maybe hasn't really stood out to me before. In verse 16, it is the word, therefore. Jesus says, go, therefore. Which connects this commission with the previous statement, right? Where Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And that makes sense. We are to go with his authority. I have this authority, therefore go, right? But as I was thinking about this, it occurred to me to think about this from the disciples' perspective. I think for them, that word obviously connects with what Jesus has just said. But I think in some ways, this word, therefore, connects this moment and this commissioning that he is giving them with everything that has come before, the entire three years since they first became his disciples. He had been walking with them, teaching them, discipling them. They had had front row seats to see who he was and what he was doing. They were witnesses of his life and ministry. And then they saw him die on the cross. And then they saw him rise again in victory. And even though they might not have fully understood what all of that meant, they knew him and they knew what it looked like to be his disciple. They knew it. And now he was giving them one final lesson. After all that he had done with them, he was heading back to the Father. And with all of his authority and power and with his ongoing presence, he was commissioning them to take all of this and spread it. Go and make disciples. You are my disciple, pass that on to others. We see that clearly in the book of Acts. That's exactly what they did, right? Now, these guys were not perfect, but they were disciples. They understood that word intimately. And so when he said, therefore, go and make disciples, they knew what he meant. He wanted them to go and reproduce what he had done with them. So, my challenge for us is this, kind of twofold. Number one, in order to make disciples, we have to be a disciple. We need to know Christ. We need to, to walk with him and have this, have this understanding of who he is. We need to, to, to be engaged with him and abiding in him and letting him work in us. It's not like we have to have everything figured out. It's not like we have to have some kind of perfect disciple making plan, but we need to be a disciple. And then we need to take all that he has done in our lives, all that he is doing in our lives, the fullness of what he has given to us, recognizing all that it means to be his disciple and his authority and in his power, 
And with this ongoing presence, we are then to reproduce that in others. We're to take that on, this good, amazing news of what it means to be a disciple of Christ. We're to take that on and bring it to others, to spread that discipleship, to, to help other people to know how amazing, how awesome it is to be a disciple of Christ. To pass that on, to make disciples of others because of what he has done in us. So my challenge for us today is to be Christ's disciple. And as part of that, a natural, outgoing, flowing part of that, to let this commission, this mission that he is calling us to, be a constant part of our lives. Be a disciple who makes disciples. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this time together. I thank you for your, um, just the work you have done in our lives. Lord, you have allowed us to become your disciples, and that's, it's amazing to know what all that means. And now in your, in your authority and in your power and with your ongoing presence, help us to spread that. Help us to reproduce the work you have done in our lives and make disciples, I pray. Help us to be disciples who make disciples. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.